this amazing group of Atlanta creatives for being with us all day today. We've kept them in our web talking and thinking about creativity. Um, when we were brainstorming this program with our colleagues at Casey and my colleagues in the education department here at the High, it was sort of a dream that we could get this group of people together. And so thank you so much for spending your afternoon with us. Um, for those of you who do not know um, these amazing people on the stage, there's a little biography sheet that you can pick up. But to my left, we have Fahamu Peku, who is a board member of the High Museum of Art, an artist, um, an author, uh, an interdisciplinary guru of all different <laughs> kinds, and we're thrilled to have you with us. Thank you. Um, to his left, we have Ryan Gravel, whose um, brainchild the Beltline is and was, and um, has also got a lot of really interesting projects in the works now, and your own new shop called Six Pitch. And then to Ryan's left is Jessica Booth, who heads up the fine arts programs at the Department of Education for the state of Georgia and has been with the education system, an art teacher, a renowned illustrator, and has done some really amazing work over her lifetime. And we're thrilled to have you, Jess. And then Stephen Satterfield, who is the chef and uh, owner of Miller Union, one of the best restaurants in the world, and has just won the James Beard Award. So congratulations. <laughs> and author of a beautiful cookbook, um, Root to Leaf. So thank you so much for being here, you all. So let's jump right into it. Um, we're really wondering, uh, our team that worked on this, where do you see participatory creativity happening in your work or your sphere of influence? So anybody who wants to jump in, please start. The least shy among okay. you. I guess I'll go since I'm right next to you. Um, uh, you know, this, this idea of uh, particip participatory creativity is very evident in my work across the board. Um, I, I'm, I, my practice is a very collaborative uh, practice. Um, and for those who are unfamiliar with my work, uh, my uh, paintings and drawings and performance pieces often feature me as a uh, sort of primary uh, figure or primary model in the work. And so this requires uh, a lot of hands to kind of uh, coordinate various aspects of it. So for example, if I'm working on a new uh, painting series, then, you know, I collaborate with photographers, we discuss ideas, we exchange ideas, but once the camera clicks, then I become someone else and I begin to kind of perform uh, based on the ideas or the themes in the work. And so I, I'm now trusting the photographer uh, in their ability to capture what it is that I'm looking for. And so this kind of uh, exchange uh, happens often in a lot of my, my projects. So. Uh, I'll just go sort of other end of the spectrum at a, from an urban design standpoint, you know, at a city scale, you can't do anything on your own, even if you wanted to. And so, uh, you know, you can play a role in, in, in generating ideas, um, but to actually implement them takes just thousands and thousands of people and, and the momentum of the city. And of course, the Beltline is a, a exemplifies that kind of idea where not only did it take uh, thousands of people and dozens of neighborhoods to believe in something and pull it off, but the idea itself, what it was that we were doing, expanded incredibly over the years beyond what any of us thought was possible in the beginning. Um, it was uh, really remarkable. We thought we were being ambitious enough, uh, but we, uh, it just kept growing. Um, and it continues to grow and change, so it's exciting to sort of be a part of that. Uh, but that's exactly what, what it is, it's playing a role in a larger creative process. Are we in order now? No pressure for the other 900 questions. Um, it's interesting, I see it all the time in schools, and I see it all the times with teachers and with students, but one of the most interesting is probably not something you would think of, is I, I just spent the last two years of my career creating new standards for the state of Georgia, and we brought together almost 300 educators from across the state in dance, theater, music, and visual arts and media arts, and seeing the creative process among people who had not met each other in many cases ever, from everything from inner city Atlanta to the suburbs, to the mountains, and our rural plains area, and seeing how those teachers worked together and took on different roles to create guidance, really, for us to have the next generation of creative Georgians. Um, 
uh, owning a restaurant and working in a kitchen, it definitely um, requires a lot of participation and a lot of creativity. Um, and also, Root to Leaf is a great example. Um, it is my work, my body of work, but it took 10 people on set every time we had a shoot to create the book. Um, there was a photographer, photographer's assistant, uh, art director, uh, two culinary assistants, prop stylist, and you know you don't think about that when you look at a book, but it, it looks very kind of solitude. There's a lot of solitude and, and moodiness in the book and the in the photographs, and even with the recipes, you have to have recipe testers. I had a writing coach, so um, just Root to Leaf alone is it, it's amazing how many people participate. And then you have the publisher and the editor, you know. So there, there really is a lot to it. But yeah, I'm, and, it, and it's. I think it's funny too in our culture, um, like you, like you touched on. It's particularly um, evident in the world of chefs, um, where we're, we're really um, put up on a pedestal. And I, when I accepted my James Beard Award, I immediately deflected a lot of the praise to the team at the restaurant. Um, it's. There's no way you could ever operate a restaurant without a team. It's like a hive. And, um, and when you create a recipe for a restaurant, it becomes um, something that has to be reproducible over and over again. And you can't personally do it yourself. And so you must trust and transport that idea to your team and have them recreate it for you. And so we, we're all kind of in this one thing together. It's an amazing thing to watch. I do it. I watch it daily, and um, and also, sometimes a teammate may say, "Oh, this, you know, I, I think that this uh, approach might work better because I'm struggling to get it to where you want it to be when I reproduce it over and over again." And I'm like, "That's a great idea. I would have never thought of that." And so that kind of stuff, I think, is really important in the recreation of food. It's almost like you take an idea and you put it into factory mode yet you're still trying to have it be like you had the golden touch that you, you know, bequeathed upon the plate. <laughs> How about you, Edward, if you step back from the research and think about your work with schools all over the country and with Project Zero? Yeah, I, I would say that, uh, you know, academic research by nature is participatory, collaborative, involves lots of people engaging in the work in, in many different ways. Um, certainly, you know, just from a scholarly perspective, you're always on the building on the work of the people that have come before you. And from uh, the, the kind of qualitative research that I do with my colleagues, you know, I have my research teams but we also have our teacher partners that we work with, um, and then you know organizations that we collaborate with, and everything. So it's it's a very participatory activity that involves a lot of people. And I like to think that you know while I'm sitting up here with you all today, there's dozens of people sitting around me that you can't see. Um, you you might feel the same way. You know, just the the people that have brought you to the moment uh, where you're speaking in front of an audience, but you couldn't I couldn't have arrived here without engaging with the hard work that so many other people have done uh, before me, with me, and continue to do with me. Yeah, I, I, I want to um, share too within the museum that uh, participatory creativity is really something that I think is evidenced in a lot of the work that we do behind the scenes. Uh, right now we're thinking uh, through the reinstallation of our permanent collections, we'll be showing work that um, has never been shown before coming October and uh, many things that uh, people have not seen for a very long time. So we're bringing in a lot of artists and experts and parents and teachers and com community members to help us think through that process. And it's really wonderful to take a back seat um, to those community members and really look at the collections through their eyes. It's just very powerful. So. Um, you guys engage with Atlanta in so many different ways, and I think up and down and across Atlanta. When you think about this concept of participatory creativity, where do you see it alive and really active within our city, beyond your own work? Just so we don't go in order again. <laughs> uh, we'll mix it up. Um, I see it, um, one of my favorite places I see it is the Wit in the Creatives Project, which was started by artist uh, Netta Abigail Skelton and art, art, former art teacher, um, still an art teacher, where it is 
the idea of giving artists affordable housing so they can stay in their communities while giving back to the neighborhood in which the housing and the studio space is. So it's this circle of teaching students about what it's like to be an artist um, and giving artists the space and um, stopping them from having financial constraints to make their work. But it also gives both the students and the artists that are involved in this um, grant opportunity space to participate with each other's worlds and the role of artist and student are flipped often in that work. Um, so it's, it's fun to watch a group of community, a community group of artists that form a collaborative and their work bounces off each other. And then they go into classrooms and schools in the city and do the same thing with those students. And it's like the students' work is influencing the artists' work, the artists are influencing each other. It's really a, a positive experience altogether. Um, I'll, I'll jump in and say that, you know, and this is, you know, uh, maybe you might have a little bit more to add to this, Ryan. Um, but I think there's a, a really great energy uh, around city planning uh, in this moment. And it's really interesting to, to think about, you know, Atlanta as a city that really sort of sprung up without, really, without any real formal kind of plan. Uh, but, you know, in this uh, current iteration of the city to see so many uh, organizations and groups and individuals coming together to really think through what do we want Atlanta to look like and when we talk about uh, participatory creativity like that's I mean like it, it's like bubbling and, and it's really exciting uh, to witness uh, I was in Oklahoma uh, a couple of days ago and I was talking to some people there and they were asking me about the art scene in Atlanta and I was thinking about the fact that uh, you know so many people have come to this city from other cities there are so many implants here uh, who come to the city and they, you know, they, they come with their own sort of uh, frame of reference for their individual professional, you know, arenas. And they come to Atlanta and they see, well, you guys don't have a, you know, such and such organization. Well, I'll start one, you know. Uh, and then these, you know, individual groups start to align with one another. And then, you know, now uh, uh, there's, there's just been a really, really great push towards this uh, kind of civic engagement in terms of how the city develops and grows from this point. Yeah, I'll add to that and just say, I mean, I, with the success of the Beltline, and it's opened a lot of doors for me, and I get to travel a lot and share this story all over the world, and people are like, what is it about, they have expectations about Atlanta, or, or uh, assumptions about Atlanta, and we have a reputation for sort of traffic and sprawl and all that kind of stuff, of course, but they're amazed to see what's happening here, and, and when, I, when they ask me, or they say, where do you live here, or I talk to students, especially young people who are deciding if they want to stay here, or some people move here because of the Beltline or whatever, there's something happening in Atlanta right now that's, that I agree is like really special. Um, and I think partly um, it's because the city is going to be a different place in 20 years. I mean, we're growing so much and changing so much, and we're coming from a place that um, in some ways isn't planned and was never figured out and never really intentional in any sort of way at the same time has a history of innovation and inclusion and uh, adaptation and growth and sort of progress, um, social, cultural kind of progress that I think opens the door for people to sort of take on their own, their own ideas and work with other people to sort of build it. And I think that the idea that Atlanta is gonna be a different place in 20 years is, is something that a lot of cities don't have, can't offer you know, um, New York is going to be New York in 20 years, and San Francisco is too. And they'll change in the margins, of course, like everywhere. But Atlanta, and I think, just has this palpable kind of feeling that something is happening. And to be able to be a part of that change and help define what it is and who it's for and what it looks like, I think, is really important. I think people intuitively, especially creative people, really understand that intuitively and sort of uh, jump in to sort of do what they can to help shape that. I agree. I think that Atlanta has um, a real kind of um, sort of a pioneer spirit, and there's there is still room for um, for different sectors and niches to to grow and thrive. And people are really open to it. And also, just being a small business owner, I see so much reception to um, sort of like the little guys that are trying to make the city a better place. Um, I also just being a, a part of the 
the good food community is what I call it. Um, there's so much uh, creativity and inclusion within that community with farmers and chefs and farmers markets. I think um, one of the most um, exciting and thriving places that you see uh, are the farmers markets that we have here and how many we have and um, how bustling and energetic they are and just this incredible um, spirit of like we can do this kind of places and um, I think that a, a lot of creativity has surrounded those because they've, they've been able to come out of sort of nowhere and turn into really um, successful business transactions and community driven um, uh, experiences. You've only been here for 72 hours, <laughs> <laughs> but you've taught two days worth of class yeah, yeah. and well, met a lot of people. I think, you know, just from what I'm hearing, there seems to be, like if we think about the idea of arts and culture in Atlanta, it seems like a very participatory kind of um, aspect of living in the city uh, and lots of people participate. I'm hearing that it's, it's very inclusive in many different ways and you know really takes in and appreciates different perspectives, backgrounds and experiences. Um, so that excites me and then uh, I have been here for a couple of days working with edu educators and they seem to you know really hold the spirit of participatory creativity both within their schools but within the broader community of education uh, maybe in particular progressive education uh, here in Atlanta. So it's, it's, it's great energy and it's, it's exciting to be here. That's great. I'm really blown away by the young people in our community. Um, you know, at the museum, uh, every year we have 18 teenagers who work with us over the summer. I know you, many of you guys know about our teen programs. We have so many students that want to be a part of our internship program and we have so many young staff that are always joining the museum and I think um, well, what I've observed is that they have these really robust creative lives outside of their work at the museum, and it's so inspiring and so exciting to me. So that kind of connects to our next question. Um, as we all sort of dug into Edward's research, we really, I think, um, all kind of got stuck on the idea that no great idea or creative output is born in isolation. So if we sort of think about and unpack that idea, that idea a little bit in, our, in your own lives, who are some mentors or some people that you've encountered over the years that have really helped you be more creative? I would love to hear about that. I'll start it. I'll say, um, I, I study architecture in um, college and grad school, and in architecture, at least in my experience, one of the first lessons was uh, no, there's no original idea. And so that architecture in particular, um, maybe, uh, you know, you're always building on somebody else's idea and some new combination and in some innovative way, but you're participating. And it takes a lot of people to pull off a building. And uh, so I think, uh, Contrary to the sort of Starkitect narrative of sort of designers right now, which would be fall in the other category, um, I do think that there's there's an ingrained sort of um, appreciation for that um, process. But I but I'll say with the Beltline, certainly the inspiration was always um, the the public and the general you know people and communities who are always. Um, excited about. We didn't go to them saying we have we have to do this. We went to say, them saying, uh, "Here's an idea. What do you think about this?" And they always brought other ideas to the table to make it better, um, to make it work for them, um, and to uh, ultimately to pull it off. And that was been just incredibly inspiring. So no one individual person, but sort of all of you all, and all of your neighbors. Um, I too. Uh studied architecture at Georgia Tech, the same program that Ryan went through. And, um, and also in cooking, the same concept. There's really nothing that has never been done before. Um, but you're always building upon ideas before you and, and they, they process through um, your brain or your team or both and you come up with sort of like a new version. And, <laughs> Um, using the same techniques, the same um, raw materials. Um, and one of my, uh, one of the things that influences me the most, honestly, is that I, I'm lucky enough to leave the restaurant and cook in other cities and cook with other chefs. 
And that to me is the collaboration of doing a dinner together or um, working on, you know, working on a dish together or alternating courses and working together in the same space. Um, we always learn from each other and we always have really interesting conversations about technique or um, outcome or texture or, or even just um, a, a neat little trick to, you know, have a, have a certain outcome when you're, when you're expanding the scale. Let's say if you're making one dish and then you make 500 of them, it's going to be a different approach. And so that kind of stuff is really valuable to me. It's, it's just a colleague driven kind of experience where we, where we share ideas and it, and it incubates into new things. Ladies first. <laughs> Thank you. I was just going to say I could probably build on that, that when I was thinking about this as you were talking, teachers are probably my greatest uh, influence and collaborators. Um, my mom is a teacher, retired principal now, but you know, starting with that, but everywhere I go, I'm, I encounter like these brilliant minds who are doing it for all the right reasons and are so generous with their time, so generous with their knowledge base, and want to make sure that everyone has this amazing learning experience regardless of the venue or, or, or what the subject is. Um, and they're just so generous with their time. They're always like, here, let me give you this idea. They don't want any credit. In fact, they typically hate the spotlight. Um, and it's, a, it's like this amazing think tank that I think sometimes in American culture is underestimated. Yeah, um, and I, I think for me there, there have been so many, like we could probably spend the rest of this conversation with me naming people who have uh, <coughs> mentored me in some way. Um, but I will say, uh, oh, I will name a, a few people. Um, uh, one in particular that comes immediately to mind is a, a, a brilliant artist who uh, lives and works now in uh, New York, uh, but she used to live here in Atlanta. And when I first started uh, with my career um, um, in terms of the, the, the work that I'm known for, uh, she would very often, you know, look at one of the paintings I was doing and be like, you know, that's it's really uh, a great idea. You should go read this book by such and such, you know. And then I would, you know, go, you know, pick the, pick the book up and read it. And be like, wow, that blew my mind. And, you know, uh, uh, you know, the next painting, she'd be like, you know, that sounds a lot like what Bell Hooks is talking about. And so she would send me over to a Bell Hooks book, you know. So my practice really began as this sort of, like, interrogation between, like, scholarship and visual art at the same time. So, you know, everything that I was doing was always in conversation uh, in that way. Uh, I think um, I will have to mention Arturo Lindsay, uh, who's another artist here, one of my former professors, uh, who stayed on my back, literally, until uh, he, he'd been pushing me for many years uh, to go back to school and get my PhD, and I'm proud to say on May 14th, I will actually graduate with my PhD uh, from Emory. So. Cool, cool. Yeah, and I think I could I could say you know many of the same things that you've said about the the professors and the and the people who have uh, mentored me or or you know influenced me in that kind of like top down sort of way. But if we think like if mentorship is being something more like 360 degrees and and uh, you know, multi dimensional, um, then um, what I, I would really like to talk about is sort of the students that I've worked with and how they've, um, you know, from a different perspective, have really helped change my perspective. Um, I was doing the creativity work for a long time before the access and equity piece came into that. And that came out of a sense of urgency from students I work with. And really, you know, from them challenging me in the work of my colleagues and saying, you know, we have to bring a new lens to this work. And I needed to be schooled in that sort of way by them. And it's it's been, uh, a great learning experience, and I, I really am, am, am so grateful for the mentorship that I've received from many of the students and teachers that I've worked with as well, especially in that regard. That's great. Well, you know, kind of building on that, because that's really at the crux of what you were talking about earlier today, and I think part of why it's so important to have, you know, this really brilliant group of people here, you know, we're all influencing, younger people are influencing us and we are influencing younger people. And as we think about you know, this really incredibly complex world that we live in and this really incredibly complex time, we were joking a little bit about social media and the internet earlier today, but um, there are so many influences on young people. What can we do and, 
how can we best prepare young people to really be happy and successful and creative and competitive if we can do that um, in, in this world that we're living in now and we're moving into in the next 20 to 40 years. What do y'all think about that? I think that um, <laughs> it's important to paint a realistic picture um, because images and social media and things can glorify um, something that and it, they may not understand the work that it takes to get there. I think I see that a lot in the culinary world. Um, where, and like I said, the, the fetishizing of, of chefs and that we have this glamorous life. And yes, I am lucky enough to travel and, and cook with other people and, and make appearances and do something like this, but there's a lot of hard work behind the scenes that people don't see and don't understand and a lot of years that go into building your career. So, um, and, I, and I think that probably applies to every single person in this room um, so it's, but I think it's, it's particularly an issue with like the Food Network and Cooking Channel and all these kinds of things where people think it's just like this hot shot, you know, you show up and you, and you flare up your pan and you, you know, take your gold medal and run off the stage, but there's just so much more to it. And so painting a realistic picture and really under letting, teaching young people the truth about a profession and, and the reality of it, I think is extremely important. Yeah, I'll piggyback on that too. I was going to say, um, just being honest, you know, with with, with children, um, uh, uh, not not just in terms of how the world works, right? But honest in terms of um, how they think about themselves and their participation in the world, right? So, uh, for example, um, you know, I, I've I've stopped asking my children, my young children, like, what do you want to be when you grow up, and I start asking them, who do you want to be when you grow up. And I feel like that makes a really big difference, you know, because it's not so much what you do as, as much as it is, like, who you are and how you move in the world, because that really impacts um, the types of things that you do. I think we have to make sure that we are creating space uh, for uh, kids to um, see and build the world that they want. Um, and and mostly this means not being um, naysayers and letting them, their, their, the possibility of who they are and their generation is, allow that to change the world because it will. And an example that I like to use a lot is, um, you know, I grew up in Chambly, um, stuck in traffic on 285, going to Perimeter Mall. That was my childhood. <laughs> There was more to it than that, of course. I had a lovely childhood, I did. But, I mean, that's the world, that was my worldview. That's what framed my view of what Atlanta was and what, and what a future here would look like. Um, and then I went to Paris and all that, and that's all in the book, you can read that. But my kids, just about a year ago, I, we live on the Beltline down off near Croc Street Market, and uh, I had to take them to the grocery store, and they were complaining about it. They were like, oh, Dad, you know, they didn't want to get in the car. And uh, they said, oh, Dad, can, if we have to go, can we at least ride our bikes? And I said, yeah, we can ride our bikes. That's what people in Atlanta do. We ride our bikes to the grocery store. <laughs> you know, they don't know how ridiculous that is. But I do, and I also know how powerful it is that that is their expectation for Atlanta. That is their expectation for their lives and for this place in the world, that it's the kind of place that you can ride your bike to the grocery store. It's the, from, our, from where we live, it's the fastest way to get there. It's the healthiest way to get there. It's the most sustainable way to get there. And that's what we did. The, the question makes me think of some work that my, my colleagues do back home at Project Zero that I really admire. And the name of the project is Children Are Citizens. And it's a reframing of education as not being a vehicle to prepare young people some, for some imagined future, but that children are citizens now. They're people now. And how can we give them that individual agency and let them know that, yeah, they could participate in the arts or the culinary industry or urban design. Uh, they could participate in many different things and to find 
find that individual agency to, to affect that role, but also the collective agency uh, to know that you know, we're all in this together and that if we have a vision for a city like Atlanta or, or broader visions for um, you know, a global perspective on what we imagine the future to be, that these young people have agency now. And, and I think what we can do is support that agency in, in the ways that we can. Yeah, I, I wanted to say something to to you as well, Jessica, and this kind of touches on something that you started you started to get into, uh, Edward. But the notion of uh, race and uh, access, uh, and um, I think it's really interesting the point that you made about you know telling certain children that they're not creative enough to participate in the fine arts. Uh, but one of the interesting things that I've I've seen in my own uh, experiences especially within the black community, is not so much telling children that they are not creative enough, but telling them that there's no life in creative, in, in creative practices, right? And so, you know, uh, people are, are steering them towards, you know, uh, career tracks where they can, or, or educational models where they can get a job, mm -hmm. right? Um, and imagining the kind of damage that's being done by denying, you know, creative minds the opportunity to explore where that can take them. And I'll build on that, you know, by telling young people that, you know, creativity is for these people and not for those people in some sort of way. And we could fill in who these and those are. Um, but, you know, creativity looks like this and it might have a particular uh, racial or social profile. Um, and if you really want to, you know, have a house and a job and a family, you can't do that because that's for that that's for that class of people, not for for this class of people. And I think we need to get beyond that and find ways that People could participate in creativity in many different ways, um, and it doesn't have to have a particular face or a zip code or, or what have you. Don't don't you think that that found me that that's one of the exciting things about Atlanta and this sort of time we were just sort of talking about of this sort of evolution that that a lot of the really creative things that you see happening in Atlanta today are happening in the African African American community, whether that's sort of the FX show Atlanta or the music scene or people like you and Radcliffe sort of cr creating these new models of people who are doing something really interesting and, and that are good not only for Atlanta but for the world and for kids to see that in a way that, that does start to at least provide a model for different kind of career paths and other things where you can do something different. Yeah, I would certainly agree with that. I mean, I think um, Atlanta is really unique in that regard, you know, being a, a, a city that has a, a very, very large, or maybe even slightly greater African-American population. Uh, you know, I mean, when as soon as I get on a plane at uh, Hartsfield-Jackson and I go to another city, I immediately feel the weight, you know, of my blackness uh, in a way that I don't necessarily experience here. Um, and I think, you know, uh, those, those uh, notions of visibility around, you know, African-American people creative, uh, participating in, the, in creative fields, I think, is very necessary for, for young children to also see. Yeah. And for their parents, too, who are afraid that their children won't be able to succeed in, in life. They and choose a creative career. And then, and then and tran teachers. translating that into, like, urban planning. I just finished a project with uh, Commissioner Keene, the planning commissioner, uh, under Mayor Reed, uh, looking at the uh, what, we, what we call the Atlanta City Design, which was the design of all that change that's coming here. How do we design that so that we become a better version of ourselves, not some other city that we don't like or recognize anymore? But in order to do that, we had to look at who we are as a place, what are our core values of this place we call Atlanta, so that we can then uh, use those, uh, make every transportation project, every stadium or streetscape or whatever we do can be accountable to those kind of values. And the first one, and the idea is that this place in the world that the, is built on the legacy of the civil rights movement and, and a city that's for everybody. That's why all the prosperity that this region enjoys today, that whether we admit it or not, is built on the back because it's the thing that set Atlanta apart from the rest of the South. And so if you build on that kind of uh, ideas, these values of equity and progress, a city that's built for everybody, then we can achieve that looking forward. And we used, um, we looked at a lot of uh, examples of how um, education, the arts can sort of be a part of that, uh, which is, is really exciting. And, and to the city's credit, they're sort of, they adopted it into the city charter. The Atlanta Public Schools uh, is gonna be teaching it this spring Every eighth grader across the district will have a five-week curriculum on the city design of what that means to be this place in the world.
It's pretty cool. I think there's something, all that to say, I think that's something really special that Atlanta's a kind of place that is looking at itself in that way. There's a moment of reflection here that I think is really special that we're not necessarily comparing ourselves to other cities anymore, but saying how do we become the best version of us? Because this city is, has some hurtful, sad, awful parts of it too, but it has a really great rich history that we can build on for, for another generation. Well, I know we want to let the audience ask some questions because there are a lot of amazing people in the room. Um, but we have one final question from our team to you all, and Ryan, you teed it up perfectly. You know, having such an um, amazing group of creatives here today, part of creativity is dreaming. And so when you dream about Atlanta and you dream about what the future will look like for Atlanta, what do your dreams look like? Uh, I, I dream about um, more bike access. Uh, I actually commuted to work yesterday on my bicycle. And um, greater solutions to traffic. Um, my, my business par partner actually was joking when they were coming up with the name for the Atlanta soccer team, uh, we were saying we should call it Atlanta Traffic. <laughs> um, instead of Atlanta United. That's brilliant. Uh, That's a lot brilliant. of really good puns could come out of that. But no, I think, I think um, we all need to be more cognizant of moving through the city in an efficient way and being um, respectful of each other and, and coming up with alternative solutions besides one person in each car. Um, I recently uh, found myself uh, a, a, a part of a, uh, a debate on social media um, with an organization that uh, has aligned itself or, or fixed itself along the southwest corridor of the Beltline um, in, in an area that's been called the SWATs for, for many, many years. Um, and uh, this organization decided to rebrand that area SWAB, you know. And so there was this, you know, large outcry, like, why, why do we need to rename you know, this area, like it has a name, it has an identity. Uh, and the people, you know, who have lived here for generations, you know, people who don't even live in Atlanta recognize the SWATs. They know what that is, you know, when they hear it. And so I, I, I say all that to say that, uh, you know, as a city evolves, as it changes, as it, um, you know, uh, grows and, and becomes what it can ultimately be, my dream for it would be that it not uh, fill the need you know, to, to like alienate or ostracize, you know, uh, certain groups of people, uh, but that it can find a way to like w coexist, uh, I guess, you know, where we can bring in new ideas, we can bring in, you know, uh, new amenities and, 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 you know, all kinds of, you know, great things to communities, but not at the, the cost of the people who have lived there and made that place what it has been, right? Um, and so the, the, the you know, so the, the dream would be that we grow together and not that we, you know, growth, you know, at the expense of another group. Yeah. I'll, I'll just add to that to say uh, exactly, and, and or, in order to follow through on that kind of a vision, my dream is that we actually follow through on the, the policies and investments that will be required to do that. Um, and that's particularly around uh, uh, ways to support uh, people who are finding themselves vulnerable to the rising cost of living. That's not only housing, uh, although it is housing is a big part of that, but also creating ladders of opportunity for people to build generational wealth and all that. So there's a lot of room in this town for more people. Uh, there's a lot of emptiness and vacantness, room for more people and creativity. We want to welcome that and grow as a city, uh, but together. And, but in order to do that, we have to make sure that people can stay. And a big part of that is the affordability crisis that we find ourselves uh, headed into. I, th I think my greatest dream is really that we start involving K-12 students in the decisions that a lot of people we've talked about on the stage today is that we often um, kind of give, we slight them a lot and their teachers because that is our next generation of Atlantans. It's our next generation of Georgia. And they're not often involved in the solutions. It's usually a perspective that is done, you know, and it's kind of pushed down from the top. 
Um, I think that there's a lot of ingenuity and creativity in students and in teachers that we don't tap very often. They're kind of not, you know, seen as, well, they work with children or they are children. But, you know, with different city planning projects and art projects, you know, getting students involved in the whole, like, farm to table movement. It's like the more they're involved at that level, the greater success we'll have, you know, year after year after year in every single one of these projects. It's, it's a daunting task, especially when you start talking about government and politics and K-12 ed. But it's, it's not undoable. It's, not, it's very doable. It's not impossible. And there's a lot of people right now who would be very interested in helping move those projects along and really get buy-in from our youngest citizens. Great. Thank you so much, you guys. Thank you. Really thoughtful. Well, we've got a mic over here, I know, and we've got maybe one over there. We would love to take some questions from you all, and then um, we have an opportunity for you to meet all of our speakers and have coffee and cookies and um, look at their books, which are amazing if you have not had that chance before. So any questions from the group? Come on up to the mic so we can hear you, please. The idea of maker spaces in schools are very popular and I would say trendy right now. And I'm interested in any ideas you all have for making those effective. Um, how would they really work the best? Because my understanding is people tend to want the maker spaces, but not really schools, but not really know how to implement that idea. That's something I know a little bit about. Um, so I, my, one of my other research projects is called Agency by Design. And since 2012, that's been ex an exploration of what we call the promises, practices, and pedagogies of maker-centered learning. Um, so how do we bring the ethos and the practices of the maker movement into various educational spaces? And that could be K through 12 environments. It could be museums, libraries, the kitchen, uh, or it could be the backyard, the shed, the, the basement basement or the kitchen table, what have you. Um, so I won't go into the whole thing, but what I might suggest is that perhaps the word makerspace is um, not serving us as best as it could be because it suggests that maker, making happens over here in this space with these specific tools and these specific materials. So rather think in terms of makerspace, what if we thought in terms of maker campuses or a maker city where making is uh, richly brought in throughout the, the different content areas or throughout our, our you know approaches to what we do in the world and how we're citizens in our city. I might also say we might wanna take a look at not the making that happens in specific spaces with what could be you know expensive tools or technologies but if we really want everyone to be a maker we have to think of making across the curriculum because there are plenty of schools that are not going to have maker spaces either those physical spaces or the time in the curriculum to devote to making so how do we bring making into all aspects of the curriculum into all the content areas uh, in some way so just some quick thoughts on that is that, you know, kind of bring an ethos of making into all the work that we do in our classrooms. And sometimes those classrooms are museum spaces or um, the backyard or the kitchen table. Great. Hello, my name is Delaram. I'm currently an interior design student. I'm working on my thesis project now, which is designing a play-based interactive learning environment for children with ADHD. ADHD is the number one disorder for children in America right now, and interestingly, Georgia has the highest record. I was interested in order to hear a little bit more about how you think the built environment, what kind of influences can have on the children who have ADHD or are suffering from any other kind of disorder. Because on my research, I um, came across multiple intelligences by Howard Gardner, which is how I heard about Project Zero. And I was interested to understand how that built interior built environment can affect these children and what are different strategies that we can do. Thank you. 
It's sort of a built environment kind of question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> I don't know that much about ADHD. I, I, I can guarantee you that the space, the physical space does, as you know, affect people. Um, my focus has always been more cities than uh, architectural space. So, and I'm not a educator either, so I don't, can't really, I don't feel qualified to answer that question. I'm equally not qualified to answer that question, um, but I, I will say there's lots of people who have done a lot of work around ADHD, um, but I, where I could potentially make a connection is thinking about is issues of um, access and inclusion and how do we make our city, our environments, our schools accessible and inclusive of the most uh, students, and, and that includes students with ADHD and other, um, what we, we, we would say it's Project Zero, uh, children with special rights. Um, so how do we support those people and, and bring them into the, the design experience? Um, I was gonna make a reference to an article called Design is Participation, so not designing for people, but designing with people, and maybe bringing those young people into the design of particular environments in some way. Um, would be the, the best way to come up with those solutions rather than taking a top-down pr approach and designing for them. Thank you, everybody, for uh, all of your thoughts and your time today. Um, my name is Sophia, and I'm a user experience designer. And we started talking a little bit about technology earlier, about social media and how that's affecting children and our future and design in general. So I have a, a little bit more specific question about something that is going to be happening in the next five, ten years, um, which is um, Virtual reality, mixed reality, augmented reality, all these things are coming, and they're coming fast. Um, what is, for your particular industries, um, what do you think is the most exciting opportunity for participatory creativity? Because with all these technologies, we'll be able to, if it's designed correctly, participate across continents in real time, across languages with artificial intelligence, so for your, set, for your particular industry, what, how could you see like, this being a really cool and positive thing? Or if you have a really scary scenario, then that would be interesting to hear as well. I, I would just say um, from my perspective, and maybe I'm just getting old, but um, I, I, I'm concerned and I struggle with these ideas because I think we're already so distracted. Um, I try to use, let's say, my phone, for example, as a tool of communication primarily, and it's already just so difficult with all the, dif all the different mediums in which, through which we communicate, um, text messages, email, Instagram, Facebook Messenger, you know, there's just like so many different ways to talk to people um, and we, are, we already struggle with keeping our communication open as a society and, and at the same time we're all kind of like in this mode. So I, I, I'm very concerned about um, how that will affect our industries and I don't see it necessarily as a positive thing because I think we're already, we need to sometimes just stop and look around us. Um, what is the, the Wendell uh, Barry, is that his name? The look and see documentary. Just stop and stop and stop and look and see what's around you, and and be a part of this earth, and not so much a part of our technology. That's just my two cents. Um, can I join in on that? The most exciting 
thing that I can think of in relation to that and in relationship to my work in K-12 um, arts education is that it gives more access to students sometimes that especially in our state where it's almost a t tale of two states there's metro Atlanta and there's Georgia um, and typically people from Atlanta are asked where they're from and they say Atlanta um, is that think of the world-class like experiences that happen on this campus and all through the city that a student could experience virtually that would have no other ac access um, that's, that's life changing for an inner city student who has, you know, um, before we had the aquarium built, there were a lot of students who had never gone to the beach and seen, you know, anything like that up close, any of those animals. It could have that same sort of effect for our arts community as far as bringing all of these opportunities where you may not feel socially comfortable going to a gallery or going to the High Museum of Art. You may feel like your socioeconomic status is, you know, not giving you access to that. But in an augmented world or in a virtual world, you could be right there in the comfort of your own home. Um, I hope it's also a place we teach students empathy because whenever you do something virtually, it's very easy for it to get nasty and I'm sure we've all experienced that with students and with children um, and lots of adults um, very quickly. So I think that almost has to be built into any interface, some way that there's also a way to teach social skills um, and to teach empathy to students so that it doesn't turn into a place that also makes you not feel comfortable. <laughs> uh, I, I would just say uh, to that, um, um, uh, maybe a little bit leaning towards your side with a little bit of trepidation, you know, uh, towards, you know, all of this like virtual reality stuff, especially as a visual artist. Uh, you know, I mean, I, I, I do believe that, um, you know, these, these experiences can, or these opportunities can provide experiences for people who may not have direct access. Um, but there's also something very visceral about engaging, you know, with, with a work of art, you know, that you can't, that doesn't translate in the digital form. You know, um, there's something about touching and feeling and, you know, all these kinds of things. And, and, and often uh, I, I fear that, you know, virtual reality becomes more of an escape than an engagement. You know, um, and so, you know, it has, we, we have to figure out a way to strike the balance where, you know, the virtual reality can be maybe an introduction, but that's not the end all. Mm -hmm. in, in my work, the, uh, sorry, um, the, uh, there's a real irony that with the technology make, making it possible to live and work virtually anywhere, that cities are urbanizing at a pace not seen in a very long time, and there's a desire for um, connecting with each other as humans, and I think that there, that will continue. I think with more and more technology, there's a, there's a, the flip side to it is people getting tired of that and wanting to connect more on a human level, and I think that that's exciting. The technology for planning, I mean, automation of transportation in particular, um, is going to radically change our world. And, and so to share one little story about how you can participate in that and how people will, whether they like it or not, there's these, this is happening in a lot of places, um, a lot of cities, but I've heard of it happening here, uh, primarily in Buckhead, where ways, uh, people using ways as sending people through neighborhoods as cut-throughs around traffic jams, but then the neighbors are uh, reporting down trees and traffic accidents to stop ways from telling to go through. <laughs> so that's your way of participating in that technology. And yeah, and I, and I think that that, you know, there's this, we talk about technology and automation and, and city, the future of the city as sort of this utopian kind of thing crafted by technology people, but they don't realize that, or a lot of them, that human beings don't make rational decisions. You know, we're passionate beings and we make decisions for all kinds of other reasons and that we will. And so we, I think the, the, the fight for what's, for the public space and how people, uh, occupy and uh, physical space in the city is going to be really challenging over the next um, 20, 30 years, whatever, which gets back to the other point of like, we should, we should answer all these problems around housing affordability and all that, because we know what those answers are. Our, our problem isn't that we don't know the answers, our problem is our political will to do it. But in the face of not doing it, we're ignoring all these other things that are also about to disenfranchise all kinds of people, and we can guess uh, who's going to be disenfranchised in that story. So uh, I think that our attention to that question is really important um, right now. 
Yeah, and I'll say that the, I, I agree that there's some trepidation around digital life and uh, especially virtual reality, augmented reality, and social media. The, the most trepid trepidatious piece for me is um, what does civic and, moral li civic and moral life look like in the digital sphere and how do we equip young people to participate in the digital sphere from the perspective of civics and morality. Um, but the exciting part for me is I feel like the digital space is a really participatory space. Uh, you kind of can't go online or interact in the way that you're suggesting without participating in some way with others. And that uh, avails young people to uh, participate in culture in some sort of way, but also to participate in politics um, and um, in ways that they wouldn't be able to otherwise. I'm, I'm kind of thinking of a project that my colleagues back home do called Youth and Participatory Politics, where through social media, through the use of hashtags, young people are engaging in political action and civic agency in ways that they wouldn't have opportunities to do otherwise. So there's, there's really powerful aspects uh, to digital life and learning, um, as well as pieces that we should be, you know, concerned and and uh, walk walk gently over. Great. I think I see Robin over yes. there. Um, I was interested in what Ryan was saying about your kids wanting to ride their bikes to the grocery store, and also what you were saying about how um, um, K through 12 students are, you know, to look at them as a resource. And I just think what happened recently with the Marjorie Stone and Douglas students organizing those marches that happened all across the country and all over the world. Um, is a great example of what these kids can do. So what I'm interested from you is how in your program, how is this communicated to school systems, to schools, so that the kind of iconoclasm, iconoclastic ideas that you have in terms of getting rid of this sort of hero worship and all of those things, how is it trans, um, transmitted um, and quickly? so that more um, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas students can be out there kind of in the world. Cool, thanks for the question. Right now it's transmitted by events like this and by uh, telling stories and, and getting the word out there. Um, I think that you bring up a really good point that there isn't a, a, a more efficient or, or faster vehicle for, for getting the word out there. But I, I hope that as we engage with one another and you know spread these ideas that people will move away from this kind of uh, individualist approach um, that someone else is going to solve their, your problems for you and instead support the type of agency that young people need uh, in order to say that no we're responsible for the the world that we live in this is our emergency and we have to attend to that emergency hi I think you have a question thank you hello everyone um, I don't really have a question for the panel I, I kind of wanted to respond to a question that was asked about maker spaces. I've been a general ed teacher for 20 years, specializing in arts integration, and now I'm a visual arts teacher. And um, I've done some research on maker spaces, and there is a school system in Albemarle County in Virginia where they took the whole school system and even the town, the area that it's in, and it's all maker space. So if you need further information, you can Google it. And so as educators and people in the arts where I think another way of um, participatory creativity is just sort of networking. And so during my research, I responded to a tweet that the school system had put out and the superintendent responded to me. And so she invited me to her school, I'm gonna go. And that's just part of the whole discussion of um, moving forward creatively. And if you're interested in makerspace, we will have a makerspace at our school next year. Um, just reach out to Albemarle County in Virginia and the superintendent, I promise you, will answer. And what school are you with? I'm at Brown Elementary in Clayton County. Oh, awesome. Terrific. <laughs> yeah, you guys have a great art program. Oh, wonderful, Brown Elementary. So we have one last question, it looks like. Um, hi, my name is Yashna. I'm from SCAD Atlanta, and my current uh, project is focusing on the educational uh, project, which is a mathematical learning center. So what I want to ask you is, have you, um, while you were learning maths, were there any sort of experiences that you wanted during your school time, but you didn't get? Um, so that it would enhance your mathematical experience and learning about it so that it's better. That's a great question. 
the experience that I hope I would have hoped to have gained when I was in math was learning how to do math. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I, 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 I did okay until I got to about algebra, and then it was, I, it, I was lost. Um, and I, you know what I mean? And it may have been the way that it was being taught. Um, I think there are, you know, really creative and innovative ways to teach math. Uh, I think, you know, when I was in school, it was a very, you know, everybody has to do it this way kind of thing. Um, and that just doesn't resonate with some minds. So I would uh, hope that uh, you know, what, whatever you create would be a space that would allow for different types, different methodologies uh, for teaching and, and, and learning uh, math for students. I, I went to public school in Chatham County in Savannah. Um, I had incredible teachers and my algebra teacher was very innovative and really took the time to, to teach in different ways so that we could all understand. I also was, um, I, I played uh, musical instruments and I, and I studied classical music and it was an incredible help for math. And it's just that it activates that part of the brain that helps with learning math. And I, I'm incredibly grateful for the music program that we had in um, middle school and high school. I think it was a, essential to my learning and to um, tapping into creativity. So I, I did, I, I liked math when I was a kid. Um, I did pretty well in it up until a certain point and then I really didn't do well in it. Um, but I, I was really gifted and lucky to have um, good math educators. Uh, that being said, um, what I miss or wish I had when I was learning math as a young person, uh, not to harp on the, the maker thing that's coming up, was more hands-on experiences. Um, because the, the, whatever I learned and however well I did, it just didn't stick. Um, I still can't my dad makes fun of me I can't calculate the tip without pulling out my iPhone um, and like just this past weekend I was making an easel for my daughter out of scrap wood that I had and I was like oh wait a minute how many degrees in a triangle oh 880 and this is an acute angle or obtuse angle and like it just you know really obvious things um, slowed me down and they didn't stick so I think a hands-on component to how we learn math um, would would have benefited me, and, and I imagine it would benefit others. Thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, you guys. Thanks for a great afternoon. Amazing.